Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to another exciting and insightful episode of MEM Live. This program is brought to you by the Master in Development Management of the Stephens Reelig School of Development and Management at AIM, or the Asian Institute of Management. MDM program in general aims to address the key question, how can we make development sustainable? In the program, students learn and embrace the approach to social issues by combining business and development principles and apply them through social entrepreneurship, impact investing, and policy innovation. This episode is one of the peace and order in time of COVID-19 series entitled, What are the impacts of COVID-19 on security and safety of industries and communities? Here we would talk about matters on security and safety, crime, violence, law enforcement, rules of engagement, and guidelines on checkpoints and enforcing lockdown measures. Without further ado, we bring you our esteemed and experienced professionals from the security, safety, and resiliency sector. So first, um, Greg, uh, will you please uh, introduce yourself and then followed by Miss Bella, Sir Ace. Yeah, so uh, my name is Greg Wyatt. I'm a director with PSA Philippines Consultancy. Uh, and, and mostly what I do is, is run a subscription service for uh, multinationals, other Filipino companies, uh, other organizations uh, that we try to provide up-to-date information about safety, security, and, and the business environment here in the Philippines in general. Uh, so thanks for having me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Isabella Luig. I'm from Solomon Security. I'm Vice President for Administration and Finance. I've been in the physical security industry since 2012, and our company specializes in security manpower services, and we've prov been providing security manpower services in the Philippines for 62 years to all the top corporations in the Philippines, as well as um, different diplomatic, um, diplomatic memories. Thank you. Sir Ace, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Ace Esmeralda. I'm the president and managing director of uh, Ace and Associates, and also the editor in chief of uh, Security Matters. Uh, Ace and Associates is an all Filipino independent security consult consultancy company. We have no uh, conflict of interest with any uh, manpower services and uh, logistics provider. We are the technical security advisors also and designers of the several projects, real estate projects in the Philippines. And aside from our other services, we, we provide also advisory to uh, several groups of companies and conglomerates in the Philippines. So I'm here as also as an uh, alumni of AIM, of Asian Institute of Management. And I am a graduate of Master of Management in way back in 1997. And right now I'm a student of uh, executive master in disaster risk and crisis management, cohort one or batch 2020. So to the listeners, uh, I hope you will learn from our, uh, our discussion here because it, this is hosted by uh, uh, MDM or Master of Development Management. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, sir. So I am here, uh, I'm Jeff, by the way, and I am here with Bert, my classmate, Bert is my classmate in the academy, and now we are again classmate here in MDM. By the way, Sir Ace is our upper class in, in the Philippine Military Academy. So, Bert, uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Okay, uh, hi everyone. I am uh, Bert Noda. I am a student uh, currently taking up a Master's in Development Management. Uh, it's true, I am a classmate, a former classmate of Jeff in the Philippine Military Academy. Uh, before I take up uh, my course, uh, the MDM, I was the former uh, group commander of a special operations unit uh, operating in Southern Tagalog. And uh, my focus of my uh, job is basically on counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency. And uh, through that, I have also shifted on community development as a new tool in addressing the problem of our national security in the countryside. So again, uh, thank you for accommodating me, guys. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. 
So we are also with uh, Miss Giselle and Miss Tricia uh, as part of the school uh, staff that uh, assist us for some technical and admin requirements. All right. So, yep. Good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome to uh, the MDM live program. So our experience in the law enforcement, uh, especially uh, for my experience no, as a lead for POSO or public order and safety in Taguig City and Puerto Princesa City, I, I've learned that we cannot really separate peace and order as they are two different things. Like, let's say a child playing, right? There's, there's no order in that, but we're sure there is peace. In war, there is order, right? Like people following commands, the standard mm -hmm. operation. So we are also with, uh, yeah, but there is their peace, right? Uh, uh, so what is that, that we want? Do we want peace? Do we want order or can we really achieve both? So in this time of pandemic, uh, order is very critical. But do we have peace? So I think that's, that's one of the questions that uh, we have to, to check out in this discussion and the further episodes. Okay, so we've known that the UN or United Nations had formed the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. And they had this one goal we know as the SDG 16 or the, the goal for peace, justice, and strong institutions. So what does that say? So that goal is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels, whether there's pandemic or not. So why? Well, so yeah, people everywhere need to be free of fear from all forms of violence and feel safe as they go about their lives whatever their ethnicity, faith, sexual orientation. Conflict develop, sorry, <clears throat> conflict insecurity, weak institutions and limited access to justice remain threats to sustainable development. So these are the core, uh, fact, core uh, principles that, that we are coming from now. So at present, we are experiencing this pandemic situation where there is lockdown and restricted movement, loss of jobs and limited opportunities to have income and, and get some ways to earn a living, limited infrastructure to facilitate online and remote lifestyle, new security policies that remains to be tested and evaluated. So while the general population stays home and do everything remotely and online, we will discuss what kinds of risks or threats that would arise from this situation. Will there be new kinds of crimes and risks to life and property that would evolve from this? So working at the AIM Situation Room, Bert and I, Sir Ace, we, we were a significant contributory to that. Uh, by the way, AIM Situation Room is uh, the, the organization that the Asia Institute of Management with the students uh, it is led by uh, Dr. Uh, Kenneth Hartigan Go. So we formed this to contribute to our society on, on addressing the issues of the pandemic. So there we had identified concerning and alarming cases on three major areas, namely the cyber crime and other online schemes, um, domestic violence and work from home or stay at home issues. And of course, issues of the general public with person in, in authority. So with, in this uh, sec, uh, I mean sectors or areas, um, we would like to ask our guests to share their insights uh, about this. So yeah, we, maybe start with uh, Greg from PSA to discuss his um, thoughts about cyber crime and other online schemes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I just wanna start by saying that one of the things that attracted me to this discussion was that all of the issues that you've identified are uh, issues of really genuine concern. And I think in particular, the first two issues, everybody's in broad agreement that, that they have increased since the start of the pandemic. So uh, many organizations and, and businesses are nervous uh, and individuals are nervous about things that may happen. Uh, but, but these certainly, particularly the first two are things that everybody agrees has gone up in frequency. 
Uh, so I, I thought that was pretty valuable. Uh, uh, to start to talk about the, some of the online uh, things that we've, we've seen increase in terms of uh, threats, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of these things get the, the tag cyber, uh, but the, I think often the, the cyber component of these threats is, is very simple. It's almost, for, for many of the things that have increased, it's more useful to think about them as online scams, right? So they have a very uh, unsophisticated cyber component and then potentially a very sophisticated social component. Yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, in terms of things that we know have, have expanded, there's been more uh, <clears throat> syndicates active in, in kind of online sales. So, uh, you know, for the consumer, that means issues with uh, being scammed in terms of their money or in, or in terms of the quality of the product and things like that. Uh, but there's there's also uh, issues that I think, and this this really has, has started long before the pandemic, but it, I feel it's probably increased, is that it's increasingly uh, you see uh, stolen or counterfeit goods being sold online through uh, marketplaces with uh, more lax regulations, perhaps. So I have an example. I want to pull up on a slide. Can I, you can see this yep. slide here? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I've anonymized this, so maybe it loses some of its effect. Uh, I, I imagine that this is a post on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, they're selling fast moving consumer goods, maybe some kind of drink mix, uh, some kind of spread, some kind of potato chips. Uh, and then the, the best example that I've ever seen that I base this upon is a, a real post, uh, but it included a note at the bottom that basically confessed, right, that this was being uh, stolen from the legitimate supply chain. Uh, so, you know, it says uh, this is obtained directly from the factory, but these goods didn't pass the packaging and texture test. So this is for parents uh, who are not picky, just practical. Right, uh, and, and you see a lot of examples uh, pre-pandemic of, of this kind of thing. I think this was the most egregious one where they just openly admitted it, uh, but there, there was a lot of that going on pre-pandemic. Uh, and you know, it, it doesn't seem like a huge deal, but uh, I think largely if you investigated this, this uh, illegitimate supply chain, right, you'd find it's probably syndicated and uh, if you tried to tackle it as a company, you could run into some really serious threats. Uh, and it probably cost the company a lot of money too, uh, as well as being a danger to uh, the, the consumer. Uh, so there, there's a lot of issues to unpack there. But I think within the pandemic, all, a lot of those accounts that were previously selling fast moving consumer goods all switched over to medical supplies, masks, alcohol. Uh, I think one of the most worrying ones that I saw was uh, a, an account selling chlorine in bulk, saying that it could be used as a dis disinfectant if you didn't have any alcohol or things like that. Doesn't sound like a, a very good or, or safe idea. Uh, and then uh, another one of the issues that uh, we know has increased or believe has increased uh, is uh, business email compromise. So similar thing as before, but there was a lot of business email compromise previous to the start of the pandemic. Uh, and then it's, there's more of it now. Uh, so business email compromise can be very uh, complicated it, or have a, a strong technical cyber component, but it can also be very weak on that side. And then kind of in the middle, you have ones where maybe there's a simple cyber component, but a very sophisticated amount of research uh, or timing that went into the social side. A typical business email compromise might look, attack might look like this. Uh, you know, the a person in, in the organization who's in charge of making transactions get a, gets an email purportedly be from the boss, uh, but the email's been spoofed somehow. So right, like if you look at this, this address, it's coming from widget maker in, uh, with the domain in Pakistan uh, as opposed to .com, right? But it, it's, it's pretty effective at tricking people on a glance. Uh, and then, you know, they maybe they, they emphasize that the transaction needs to happen Right now, it's important, something like that. Uh, the person is embarrassed that they weren't available right away when they were supposed to be working, you know, they're working from home. Uh, and then they say, send money to this account, right? Uh, and you know, in this case, the, the person in charge of making transactions does the right thing. And they say, 
I need to call you just to confirm that you actually who you are, who you say you are. And they, the attack is as simple to defeat as that. Uh, but, but like I said, uh, you know, the, the cyber component of this can be as simple as, as spoofing the, the email address. Sometimes it's disguised very poorly. It might be from uh, uh, email at cloud.com or messenger.com, something like that. That's not, can't, if, if anyone read the line, they wouldn't see it. Sometimes it's like this, where they at least make it uh, resemble uh, uh, the, the original email. Uh, and then in other cases, like the, the server could be compromised or somehow, or, or the boss's uh, email account could be compromised. So there's a pretty big range in terms of, of that side of things. And then also there's a big range on the social side of things, right? So so there's cases that I've yeah. seen where uh, where like the person really researched the organization. You know, maybe this maybe this case, Angel, the the first our theoretical person in charge of the transactions, uh, doesn't have an online presence. Uh, maybe uh, maybe the attacker waited until the boss was on a business trip. So to, just to make sure that they wouldn't be in the office at the same time. And, you know, as we're working from home, we're not in the office together. So this is more likely to succeed. Uh, and, and maybe they really understood how that organization worked. Maybe, you know, in this case, John, uh, he, he always just tells Angel what to do. Yeah. Angel never, never pushes back and it's just very like subservient, right? Never asks any questions or things like that. Uh, and they, they picked the person in the organization that was most vulnerable. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of scams online, but I think these are two that are most relevant. I think potentially maybe business email compromise might be the, the uh, just in general, the threat that, it, that, most, that affects most organiz uh, more organizations than any other. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there for now uh, and, and maybe come back if we have questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Greg. I, I'm really like um, very, interested when you said that while we call this cyber crime the cyber component of it is really smaller than compared to the social component of it right so yeah so for our viewers here it is nice for us to note that for us to protect ourselves we don't really need to rely so much on the technical side of cyber and it stuff for as long as you are socially aware you're empowered you protect yourself and uh, and analyze that the risks in your in your areas, then you you will be safer, right? right. All right, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that, Greg. Uh, we will come back uh, in, in case there are questions uh, at the discussion section. So uh, we, we move to the next topic, which is uh, domestic violence and work from home or stay from home risks and and issues. So yeah, we could ask uh, Sir Sir Ace uh, for this one since yeah. Yes, sir. Please, please go ahead, sir. Hello, everyone. Um, well, thank you for assigning me, Jeff, no? on this uh, very uh, short and simple but controversial uh, topic no? on violence. So let's agree that uh, Greg has mentioned already that now that we are work at home, most of the things now are practically uh, what we call as uh, inside the house no? or uh, domestic violence. But first we have to understand first the definition of violence so that uh, we have a common understanding on what is uh, how we define it, um, violence. No? So that is really the intentional use of physical force or power. No? So you can see here that the intention is really very important. No? The intention is really very important. And then another is that uh, the physical force, but then there's also that thing about using also or causing psychological harm. You know? So it doesn't really need that uh, violence has to be physical harm. Yeah. We, we can see that uh, when you are in just one house, you will really have that uh, uh, exposure to psychological uh, violence, especially if you are already used to go out and then suddenly you are with uh, a person that you married to or you have a relationship with and you are together for not only for 24 hours, but more than 24 hours. So in the context of uh, violence or domestic violence, it's just really related to RA 9262, which is the anti-violence against women and their children. So it's defined here that it is violence against women 
And it refers to a series or an any act or a series of acts committed to any person against a woman. By any person against a woman who is his wife, former wife, and against a woman with whom the person has had or sexual dating relation, relationship. So you can see here that uh, there's a, a big difference uh, in this case. Now, let me go also to another by, uh, definition. Violence against women is not limited to physical harm, but extends to emotional and psychological injuries, and also addresses discrimination in workplaces. So the dynamics here is that now, if your wife is used to work in a, a physical site office, now the workplace is now in your home. Also, this has been the this has been the question also of Jeff. I remember when he asked, "What is the what is the extent or the jurisdiction of the company when the people that you cover or you secure or you uh, monitor inside your physical office, especially those in the infrastructures in uh, big urban areas?" Now those cubicles are practically transferred into a laptop, no, sitting on the lap in a house, no. So, where is now the definition of workplaces? I think that is a very nice discussion later. I will not discuss it in my time now, but later with everyone. Now, we have to consider also that uh, there are types of violence. No, there's physical, there's sexual, emotional, economic neglect and deprivation. So sometimes. We forget that neglect and deprivation is also a form of violence. So people will always say, how can that be? But then if you look at the, the survey in uh, three years ago, we don't have the latest as of, uh, because of the survey are started done almost every five years. One of the four, which is 26% of ever married women experience physical, sexual, and emotional violence. One in five has ever experienced emotional violence. So you, you can see here that that uh, number uh, bu bullet three shows that only 14% experience physical violence. So that means the non-physical the non-physical uh, violence are in the non-physical. Okay, so look at the crime rates now. If you look at the crime rates, and we got this from the Philippine Commission on Women, and they extracted this from the national police data. You can see here that, that the columns are arranged by the, by the Republic Act that are being violated. No? So if you look and zoom in your screen, you can see there that uh, the first one is uh, Republic Act 9262, which is anti-violence against women law. And then there's that uh, 8353, the anti-rape law of 1987. Then we have the Article 336 of the, Republic, uh, the revised penal code which is the act of lasciviousness. Then we have concubinage, then anti-photo and video voyeurism, anti-trafficking in persons, anti-sexual harassment, and then the RA11313, which is the safe spaces. And then probably all the bills that are coming up, uh, like say uh, the anti-bastos bill, which is here, and then uh, the GMRC bill. You can find out that they are not really going down no they are from comparison they are going up during the lockdown but then most of us are focused on the eight focus crimes of the of the pnp the eight focus crimes that uh, they look at let me narrate them they are they are murder homicide physical injury rape robbery f carnap of a motorcycle and carnap of motor vehicle all these have decreased. You can see here that almost everyone, all the focus group went down more than 50%. But those below 40% are against persons. But those against uh, non-persons, they have this, this decreased uh, significantly. No? But then if, if that is the comparison from the statistics of December 24, 2019 and to March 16, and then March 17, to June 8th of this year. So this is a this is this shows to us that the drop is is very uh, is very significant on all the focus crime rate. In Luzon, that's the biggest drop because it has the highest crime anyway. And then if you if you compare it into this uh, in Visayas, 
there is also significant drop, 54%. In Mindanao, it's 49%. So we can see here that these are all uh, crime rates that has gone down. But significantly, if you look at the other side, in the quarantine violators, it's really going up no? because uh, there's never been a quarantine law that you're violating. So what happens here now is that uh, we have all these new numbers. This is from zero now to 65%. So there's no comparison of, uh, of previous non-quarantine days. So in short, we need to look at other crimes. No? Where did the other uh, incidents or suspected uh, crimes happen? So my tip here is that I have, I have six tips here. No? Uh, first is that we have to compare data of the past three years. This is very challenging. And in fact, we, we use at Ace and Associates, we always use a three-year comparison because in every three years, you usually change uh, local governments, you know, the LGUs. And uh, we usually change also chief of our police every two or one, two or three years. So usually every change of commanders, there are different treatment of crime. So we might have a distortion in the data. So you compare it while the, the, the commander of the PNP is the same. Usually, and then the data are usually not that uh, open in real time. So it, it, you really have to wait for uh, the uh, latency of one or two months. No, Our data shows that we are just one month uh, behind. That's uh, reasonable and that's very significantly good. And then number two, you have to look at the types and the targets of crimes that are changing before the crimes are committed in the street. Right now it's committed inside your home. but. Right now, is for example, here in Bacol, where I am now, there are so many significant uh, break in in the house, resulting, resulting to murder and significant uh, losses inside the house, inside the restaurants, because at nighttime, everyone is now just wearing a mask. You know, you have to look at it different way. Before, if you're wearing a mask, you are a suspect for a crime. Now, if you're not wearing a mask, you're already being arrested for violation of quarantine policies. So anyone going to your house with a mask is a challenge because even if you capture them with your CCTV, how can you identify them if you, they do, they do it at night and you don't have ample lighting to your whole CCTV? So practically the CCTV is just a recording that you're victimized. And then, Let's hope that your CCTV in your house, which is a really advice next to your dogs and to your lights, is that they should be really a help into investigation and solution to your crime. Number three, changes in the law enforcement will alter crime rates. For example, the police now are focused on the checkpoints. They are looking at what? Wearing of PPE. You know? Probably most of the people there are, uh, there's a joke that several people, our men were were accosted by the police for not wearing a face mask, but they're all armed with illegal firearms. So these are just jokes, but then if you have a of, of tired uh, law enforcement and they're focused on the PPE because that's also the social pressure from the social media perspective. Now, number four is people may be less likely to report crimes in like lockdown. This is report a lockdown when you know that the presento or the or the precinct or the police station is populated with people also cannot practice social and physical distancing in a precinct. How do you, you cannot also just report uh, uh, crimes through Facebook or through digital form because the police will always require you to have your presence there because you have to sign it in front of, of uh, law enforcement. So that's what you call the blotter. Number five, local crimes trend to vary a lot and appear dramatic. Yes. Just like what I mentioned in Bacolod, armed men went, went in, entered the house or they went over the, the, the gated communities, they entered the house, they just, they just uh, shoot anyone there. So the mere killing in early morning becomes more dramatic because generally crimes are going down. But a single crime will all look dramatic. You know? there is that, there's prominence in that crime itself. Then lastly, number six, does the crime statistic tell you of the stories? What stories does the crime statistics tell us? No, uh, granting they're all uh, really reported because the the PNP will only record what is reported to them. 
So what does the story go? Well, what's the purpose of the story? So now, when we ask about what's the impact to the workplaces, what's the impact to the industries of the diminishing crime? Go back to the chart on focus groups, huh? uh, the focus uh, crimes. The focus crimes tells you already that this happened whether in residential, industrial area, or in the public area. So you can see there that uh, the, the lockdown, the, the control of the movements helped really in bringing down uh, the eight focus crimes. So we, we can discuss later on the aspects of uh, how crime or the lockdown contributed to the, to the security of the offices, which are usually guarded by private security agencies. So I think that is really the, the line of uh, our next speaker. Thank you yeah. very much and stay well, everyone. Thank you, thank you, sir. So yeah, like like what sir I said, uh, let's let's uh, uh, discuss these uh, key issues uh, later. Okay. Um. So now we proceed to the third uh, topic, which is issues between person of authority and the general public. So I guess Miss Bella can can share her thoughts on this. Oh, sorry, Miss Bella, you're you're still on mute. Hi, um, I think for the issues of the general public with people in authority, I think social media has blown this out a lot in the past in the past couple months to the point that people are actually already losing their trust to people in authority. When in fact, with everything happening right now, like Ace mentioned earlier, like it's only considered a crime if it's being blotted. So I believe that there's this strong disconnect between the image of authority and what they're actually supposed to be doing. And I think what can bridge the gap there is actually educating people that authority can actually help you. Um, but I guess there's a very fine line with, with people's beliefs at the moment um, when it comes to that. Um, I guess we don't really know. It's a very sensitive topic at the moment, I think. Um, yeah. But a lot of the cases that are currently happening and are currently being publicized on social media, I think, are are outliers in the statistics when, in fact, um, the authority is actually able to help us, um, you know, uh, blot their certain crimes that are committed and actually, they actually, they can actually help us get somewhere, right? But it's all about if you believe in that. Um, but I think we shouldn't lose our we shouldn't lose hope in, in believing that the system can actually help us. Hopefully down the line, it can help more people. Um, but we also know people who can help us, um, you know, how, uh, go through the system. Yeah, that's all I have for that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. I, I guess Bert has something to uh, add to, to the issues that we wanted to discuss. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Bert. Okay, uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, actually for me, uh, with the current uh, uh, situation right now, it also provides us with a lot of opportunity, particularly on the aspect of uh, development. Uh, before, as you all know, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, directions in development before the COVID, wherein a lot of industries is coming on. But right now, uh, we notice that uh, the non-essential industries uh, they need actually in order to survive. They need to shift to the essential industries. So, for the part of the I see, development manager, uh, for our background, um, we we see here a lot of opportunities to to focus our development efforts, particularly on the on the on the on the side wherein we can produce. Uh, there, actually, there are a lot of industries that actually really align to the SDGs. Um, for example, right now, we noticed that as I go on around the, the, uh, in different regions in Southern Tagalog, in Central Luzon and Northern Luzon area, uh, I noticed a significant rise in the aspect of development, particularly on the food production. So the, the COVID pandemic had uh, actually showed us that not only that the medical practitioners are very important, it also showed us that the farmers, the agriculture side, this kind of development should be given focus by the government. And right now we have seen that the government is already acting on it. And they have, I think, uh, I don't know what's the progress right now, but they have been uh, promoting a, a, a kind of a Balik Provincial Program 
which is actually a, a good sign also. So as 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 uh, as we all go with this concept, uh, with this kind of uh, situations right now, and hope that this uh, provincial program will be successful. But as a development uh, manager, I also promote this concept of having really giving emphasis on the agriculture side because this is we should be doing the basics. So before the COVID, uh, when I was studying on the kibbutz farming system, I noticed that in uh, the, uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority that they have they have uh, uh, stated that 54 percent of the total population of the Filipino population is residing in the countryside. And out of the 54%, a large portion of that is actually uh, hand-to-mouth subsistence uh, kind of farming. So right now with the current development, it also gives us opportunities. And right now I have been talking with some of the venture capitalists, uh, investment bankers from Europe and the uh, US. They are willing actually to, to help out in the side of uh, promoting this uh, kind of ventures in agriculture. And this is also a good opportunity because, uh, you know, if we ventured in, uh, in uh, food production, in the food security, uh, actually, if you're going to use, uh, do the math, uh, agriculture can have the chance of uh, rebooting our economy. So it is a great uh, help for the current uh, situation right now. And aside from that, uh, maybe I can add later on on the aspect also of uh, Jeff, uh, aspect of security. That's a nice to uh, topic to talk about later on. Okay, that's all for my part on the development management part. All right, thanks, 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 Bert. Yeah, so I guess we've discussed in passing or along the, those lines, the impact already and then some of the measures that we wanted to do. But yeah, so maybe we could we could go back to some uh, um, issues that we, we we passed by a while ago. So especially about the work from home issues, right? We, we've discussed a while ago. Sir Ace shared that there seems to be a gap about the scope and jurisdiction of government, or maybe the private space and the the, the work. The what's this? the company or the corporate that, that where the person is employed. So yeah, do, do you have some thoughts on this? Let's, let's tackle this on a discussion way. Yeah, so maybe Sir, Sir Ace can start this since you've brought it up, sir. Well, with the changing environment, you know, the environment meaning the workplaces, it's really a, a, a thing that most of us haven't really prepared that we are, we are really caught into that uh, situation wherein the bandwidth, for example, is dedicated to a building. Where in a lot of our modern building, you have all the focus of fiber technology. You have all the focus of your physical uh, and uh, cyber firewalls. And then suddenly, you find yourself that you have to distribute the bandwidth or even give access rights to people who are working outside your, uh, your network. No, that is on the cyber side. But then if you look at it in the physical side, your responsibility now of your employees, of your employees or staff or your partners is somehow transferred to themselves only. You transfer to themselves that they take care of yourself in your home, but you're working for me and I own your office hours. So those are really the tricky part. And then what is now the responsibility of, for example, you, Jeff, you are with Amazon, for example. And like me, when we have clients, they always ask, where is now the responsibility of the company when our staff are working at home using company resources, except that uh, they are using their home uh, internet connections. So Greg can say about who owns the data, no? who owns the information that passes through uh, a net, not a network owned by the company. So these are the challenges, but the question really is, what if workplace violence is transferred to domestic or home violence? And then it is done during somebody who was in a Zoom meeting, and then the Zoom meeting is a company meeting, company time. So these are the areas that has to be resolved. Another thing is that who, now, who, uh, who is now uh, uh, taking care of looking at the risk uh, exposure? 
Because if your people are inside your office and they're moving around inside your campus, for example, and it is within the eight hours of the day, that is the burden or the responsibility of the corporate security or the corporate health, safety, and uh, environment offices. But then if you transfer them outside, then that's the question. You are, we are now outsourcing the risk to our own employees. What do you think? Yes, yes, sir. I totally agree. So I think this is one area that our DOLE or Department of Labor and Employment could look into for their policy innovation or maybe policy uh, development. Yeah. So yeah, anything from our guests? Yeah, um, I think I think it also comes down to how much responsibility an organization wants to wants to take in. For example, we have one client with about five thousand employees. And, um, and they have a security operations center. And this security operations center, whether they're at home or at work, um, but of course work is now at home, um, they take care of the clients in, in their respective areas. And of course the clients phone in and there's an incident coordinator. The client can phone in whether or not they got into a traffic accident, whether or not um, a, petty, a petty crime happened in, in their area and they have to go and get it blottered. So they call their incident coordinator. And of course we assist um, the client uh, to the precinct or through this um, incident that has happened to them. So I think the question is how much responsibility do corporations want to take, right? Um, because there are corporations already or um, uh, large organizations that take responsibility for their people, whether or not they are at the actual workspace. Um, but yeah, I think setting up an incident response center or a security operations center and of course incident responders um, to be roaming around the metro at all times, especially during this work from home arrangement, would be um, a highly recommended thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think also maybe as simple as providing our employees uh, emergency contact numbers, which are close to their house, and then giving them a system or let's say a, a panic or a security assistance button on their on their laptops or maybe cell phone that would trigger at least the the company, right? So these are these are some innovations that I think um, big companies are already looking at. Yeah. Yeah, or as simple as also just like a hotline. Like, is there a yes. hotline they can call where they can ask for help, right? Because a lot of the times when we try to call the government hotlines, it's hard to get through. Um, so do our own organizations have these hotlines that we can get through, that we can ask for help when needed? But most organizations are just setting this up, hopefully. Um, some organizations already have that. But of course, after they've set that up, is like, do they have people that can respond to these, right? Or who will, what's the, what's the chain of command in terms of these um, incidences as they occur, right? Or the escalation process? Yeah. Um, who's supposed yes. to be responsible for what? Yes, uh, I think aside from uh, having hotlines, right? uh, for me, you have to be pragmatic about it, no? The headlines of uh, your private organization, especially if you have so many, if you have clients, like say for the case of Suleiman, uh, you can, you, you, we realize that a hotline of a private organization with a very efficient uh, security guard force and, uh, and uh, snappy officers, they can provide the, the hotline services faster than the government hotline. Because uh, it's just different. You know, you can always have that KPI that the guard should always answer rings in five, five, five calls no? and then answer all the messages. But then the question now is that at the age of lockdown, what is now the physical response to a, to a call for help? No? So that goes back already to the preparation that you can allow your security and safety services to have exemption to, to provide emergency services. Because if the call for help in the hotline it's more of a technical support. Then there, that, there could be technical people calling to you remotely and teach you what to do. But when it's called for help, it, it calls for an AVAC, you have to look at and well, how are we going to address rescue? Now, the question is, and looking at the situation of uh, COVID, can we just simply rescue someone? We have to look at what is the situation especially now that we are in the COVID-19 lockdown or quarantine. What if we have another typhoon in the middle of this? We have already three. What if in the middle of a large typhoon or a big typhoon in Metro Manila, for example, 
are you going to rescue your employees? Are you going to send reinforcement? But then you're not sure if they are positive or negative. Will the people now be comfortable to be rescued by someone who has been moving around the community also at the age of, of, uh, of uh, COVID? So those things are really going to look at. No? It, there could be a scenario that we are, we are at uh, the situation room at AIM has been talking about double whammies, triple whammies. But if you look at it, we have to really prepare for the new normal. We are being set for a new normal, especially in the Philippines. When we are still number, we are still in the top 10 in the most risk country, we, know we are now number one in one uh, category, number three in the global risk aspect, or number nine as the most exposed to disaster, we are always in the top 10. And we should have that mindset that even before COVID, we should have been preparing for a double whammy, whether it's a, it's a, it's a pinatubo with explosion and typhoon, or it is Taal with the typhoon, and now COVID with Taal and typhoon. So we really have to pre pre prepare for that. For the corporate world, for the industrial security, it has to be really looked into that. Because even if you prepare as a security company or a security organization, and your MSMEs or your company is going to shut down because of the lockdown and the business and the economic impact, the financial impact to their books, you might not have any clients anymore. You have no, you will just be protecting assets that are just there to be prevented from being vandalized. So there are really a lot of dynamics. Yes, thank, thank you, sir. Um, Greg, we have a question here from the audience. Um, you can either uh, share from the discussion or you can choose to answer this. Okay, uh, let, let me read this. Um, this is from Lester Barcillo Gastala. Good afternoon, sir, Lester. Um, Sir Greg, uh, thanks to Greg Wyatt of PSA for mentioning about security on the cyberspace and its social component as the most critical. What areas do you recommend or uh, think should we prioritize to secure the next normal business environment? What actions should we take? Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, you know, other than, than doing things about uh, that maybe you were doing before, like teaching yeah. people about scams, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that your physical IT uh, structure has some uh, the, uh, the protections and uh, that your IT staff is updating your virus software, all that kind of thing. Uh, I think a lot of it's industry specific, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example of one yes. of the big problems, right? Let's, let's talk about the BPO industry, right? So there are BPOs that are growing right now, uh, even under lockdown conditions, uh, but uh, the biggest employers do voice, and voice uh, is kind of hard under the current conditions, particularly if you're dealing with sensitive information, right? Yeah. So uh, it seems to me, unfortunately, that that a lot of the people that uh, were, were uh, a lot of the organizations that were operating using voice will find uh, using AI bots and, and things like that more attractive because you could just build in more protections in terms of that customer service experience. Uh, when they have to hand over the credit card information, you have an, an IT component that can protect the credit card information more than you can giving the credit card information over the phone, for example. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, at, at, uh, the problem with that is that uh, that's where a lot of people are employed in the BPO industry. It, the biggest employer in BPO industry is that is uh, voice? Uh, so, yeah, I think a, a lot of it's going to be industry specific, and there's got to be hard questions like that. Uh, and but you know, specifically talking about the social thing, like we were earlier to jump back. Yeah, a, a lot of this stuff is is pretty uh, easy once people understand the modus operandi. And yes. so, just find, finding the right ways to ed educate your staff and the right staff about the different cybersecurity modus uh, operandi that they face. Uh, you know, with business email compromise, it all the attack all breaks down once someone picks up the phone anytime that there's a, a new transaction or a strange transaction details, a change in transaction details, that kind of thing. So uh, I hope some of those thoughts help. But I, I did want to jump back to the yeah. domestic abuse, uh, just in terms of productive steps that companies can take. You know, I, first off, I'm, I'm just really struck that like we don't, we have no idea where we are, 
right? Just that uh, that all, all we have are really big questions, and and we're just learning the kinds of steps that we can take, and we just ask end up asking harder questions sometimes as we do. But I think one one potential thing that may help uh, with with this issue and in general with uh, the kinds of stresses that people are experiencing in the work from home environment is some companies are uh, making kind of mental health counselors available. Uh, yeah. You can sign up for a, a one hour Zoom session with the, the company mental health counselor or psychiatrist or someone outsourced to do the same service. And you know, I, I would feel that that would, would help uh, with, the, with the domestic abuse issue as well, uh, just because uh, those, those kinds of people, you know, you're more likely to identify the complaints and the issues. And uh, the, the people in the mental health industry are often experienced uh, with, with encountering those kinds of issues. So, yes, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Okay, guys, in the interest of time, um, anyway, I think we've discussed uh, along the way some of the points that, that we plan to, to share. Um, but now, uh, since uh, we were planning to have another episode in, on this series, so we can go back to this and inject some of the issues that we would learn along the way, right? So yeah, as a, for our last message or last note, maybe we could ask everyone to, to say their thoughts on the topics and uh, uh, share whatever, whatever they want to share to our viewers. We can start with um, Sir Ace, sir. Or your last okay. thoughts, sir. Yeah, well, last thought is that if you focus on uh, the domestic front, if you want your house or place secure, first is really you have ample lighting. If you can have a dog, have a dog. No, and number next is that uh, you have you should know the number of your friend that you can call in case of emergency. If you're in the condo, you should really know how to call your security guards. No, if you're in a village, you should know how to call your nearest uh, barangay tunnel. If you are living in another place where you are not, you don't have close neighbors, then probably your friend or your relatives. When it comes to what I've said about by Greg on mental health, really, in uh, in the resiliency Philippines or in the resilient.ph uh, uh, program, we really find that resiliency really starts in ourselves in our mind. So we should really look at into our what's going on inside ourselves, and if we really need help. Don't be shy. We can always, you can always call a friend. You can call anyone, and then even look for a counselor from your company, from your circle of friends, from your church. And then, for me, the best way really is to pray and to meditate. And to meditate. To everyone, to the listeners, stay well, you know, and God bless. Thank you, thank you, sir. Then, Miss Bella, if you have something to share. Yeah, um, I think the two most important things to do right now is to really just communicate and educate yourself. So communicate like what A said with your community around you. Know who to call uh, when you need to call someone. Um, also, don't hesitate to, to call someone when you do need help. And also educate yourself on what is going on around you, um, not just with the security issues going on around you, but also with like what A said, like what's going on inside of you and how how to deal with what's going on around you. So that's all I have is just communication and education. And I think those two can go um, a long way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bella. Okay, Greg, please. If, yeah, yeah, I just I just wanna encourage us to, that uh, I, I think it's really worth uh, spending time into thinking about these issues uh, and, and how we as organizations and the private sector are gonna tackle them because uh, not only is, is the COVID crisis going to last a few more months, but really the, the workplace is not going to look the same afterwards, right? So, you know, take PESA, for example. You know, PESA is really restrictive in, in terms of work from home, and you're only supposed to have about 5% of your staff working from home at any one time, but there's a big push to change that with uh, and to, to move it up to 30%. So, you know, maybe in the future, uh, in the past, maybe 5% of your staff was working from home, Right now, 90% of your staff is working from home. But then once this is over, it, it might be 30%. And uh, there's a lot of good things that can come out of that. You know, I mean, I, I think a lot of companies uh, find um, the traffic situation is, is limiting in their productivity. And work from home is a great way to, to partially deal with that. Uh, so I think in, in the long run, it's, it's worth us 
it's worth it for us to really spend a lot of time thinking about uh, how we can uh, uh, what are the best practices in terms of countering these kinds of issues and what are the solutions because I don't think uh, it, the workplace is not going to be the same when this is over. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Greg. Okay, uh, Greg, do you have something to say? Yeah, I just had uh, two points uh, for uh, for my part. Actually, uh, right now I'm uh, observing on how people are opening up their the new the new normal business. Actually, right now the uh, most of these industries are more focused on the sustainability aspect of. Uh, of uh, business development. Uh, before, uh, as you can see around, you can see a lot of people doing this door-to-door -door delivery. This is actually a good sign that uh, we as a country, as a people, we are we will become resilient uh, in the long run. We can, we can adapt this. And another part is also on the response. I just would like to, to share also on the response of the people with regard to the law enforcement uh, uh, officers or agencies, uh, we have heard a lot of news regarding uh, policemen shooting like this and that. Actually, uh, if you are going to compare this to other countries, um, in, 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 in the country, there are a lot of, there are actually uh, isolated cases where uh, men in uniform are involved in this kind of uh, things. However, these are just uh, isolated cases because in in, uh, in most uh, areas of the country, you can see the people reflecting. Actually, they are already on the first, uh, actually in the first two months of the pandemic, they have this negative uh, perspective and they don't want to be to be put in one place. This is the reaction of the people. But right now, they have no choice. They have to be adapted or else uh, they will go crazy. So right now, uh, it's just a matter of like, uh, Instead of going out, you just have to spend time with your family uh, at home. So this is the reaction right now with the people. So they are slowly adjusting. And, and the good thing about it is that uh, in my experience, I've been around uh, traveling in many places in the, from southern Luzon going to northern Luzon areas. Uh, the checkpoints are, are already loosened. Um, uh, although they are still checking if uh, you follow the the social distancing in the vehicles, but the, 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 the men who are in charge of the checkpoints are actually more lenient compared to the first two months of the pandemic. And uh, so you have mentioned about the negative impact also on the crime. So, you know, crimes are uh, because shifting in this pan pandemic. I would like also to, uh, like also to share uh, in my, in the area where I, I used to operate with regards to insurgency problem, the national security problem. Actually, the pandemic has uh, done something good about it. Uh, you know, the, the uniformed servicemen, the military, the police who do usual uh, combat operations before, uh, when the pandemic comes, they have a lot of restrictions. And uh, as I noticed, in the, based on the reports of the, the movement of the armed group, not only on the CPP and PNDF, uh, the, the new people's army, but also on the armed group on the side of this uh, 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 terrorist in southern Mindanao. So, uh, as we observe, there is a lesser uh, movement at, at present, and uh, we are going to always uh, relate this to the aspect of since people are affected by the pandemic, less and less people are now supporting giving logistics to these uh, armed groups right now. So, you know, without the logistics, without food, without uh, support, they cannot stay in the mountains for long. So right now, they become vulnerable. Some of them, if you are going to see the news, actually, almost every other day, there are NPA rebels going down, surrendering to the government forces. And it is also a positive side on this aspect. So I just hope that I'm not hoping the pandemic will last for two years, but I'm hoping that the the, the people will realize that uh, uh, there is more sense in uh, the importance of being family together than just going to the mountain and fight the government. So that's all for my part. Thank you. Yes, thanks, 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 Bert. Yes, so thank you guys. Thank you for all the sharing. Um, yeah, we're, we're about to end.
So just for me, you know, just a general note on what the, the things we discussed. I think, yep, yes, there's a, a social issue on why there's criminals or why there are violators. And then again, there's a separate social issue why these opportunities come, right? Like for the first one, I guess one of the social issues here are, of course, um, lack of awareness, poverty, lack of education, right? And then for the second one, why there's opportunity yes i think maybe one of this is of course corruption that's why there's uh the environment uh, provides opportunity for these crimes and uh violations and then of course i think um one of one of the reasons also is lack of uh empathy among both the private and the uh, uh, government uh, leaders you know, which i think we should work on more later on in in collaboration with with all sectors and then thirdly, there's a social issue why people become targets. So yeah, I think if we address these things, maybe everyone can wear the dress they want, right? <laughs> All right, so that's, that's, that's my last note there. And uh, thank you, guys. I hope Zoom has a handshake feature aside from the clap and the uh, thumbs up so we could handshake online. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you to all the viewers who watched and supported us. Thank you to Ms. Trisha, Ms. Joselle, to, to ZSDM School and Asia Institute of Management. And of course, Sir Ace, Ms. Yes, Benda, and Sir Greg, and Bok, Bert. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy weekend, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe. Or